All right, we are back. Another episode of Breaking the Safe with Ryan Ripley and Yuval Urit. Yuval, how you doing? Good, good. How are you, sir? Very good. I've been looking forward to this one. We kind of got into this during the Scrum Master discussion, but I think uh, a full episode dedicated to the product owner is in order, especially um, this idea of why did Safe break the product owner role? And now you could look at it as actually breaking the role or breaking up the role. Uh, I think that's going to come under some debate here. But uh, this is where we're going today, and this is what we're going to look at. So, um, you've all you've provided this nice uh, image for us to look at. Uh, what is it about the product owner role, and it, especially within Safe, and and why is it broken up into product owner, product management, and then like release train engine? It seems like a lot of the things that we would consider to be uh, in the domain of a professional scrum product owner has been busted up into a lot of little pieces. Um, yeah. So what's behind that? So first maybe uh, let's talk about what, what safe's perspective on this. And then sure. we can talk about the why and the impact and when we, what we see in the trenches. So the fact is in safe product ownership is provided at, or SAFE's approach to product ownership is to look at the organization and say, okay, there are multiple layers. There's the team layer, there's the team of teams layer, there's you know even teams of teams of teams in the portfolio. And for each one of these layers, product ownership is crucial. So there's no argument there. Um, product ownership with a product customer centric mindset is crucial. We talk about design thinking, we talk about customer centricity, using all of the tools that product ownership um, that we talk about in product ownership in Scrum. Having said that, Safe's choice is to basically say for each one of these layers, we have um, a slightly different role in the product ownership um, ladder, let's call it, or in the product ownership domain. At the team level, we have the product owner. At the team of team, agile release train program, we have what's called product management. If you have even higher levels than that, you have solution management and you know epic owners at the portfolio. Why did SAFE make this choice? Like we talked about in the Scrum Master episode, SAFE takes the perspective of learning a lot from experiencing the trenches and what organizations have been doing. And a lot of organizations have been struggling to scale product ownership when we're talking about multiple teams. So this is an area where different scaling approaches take a different perspective. Uh, SAFE is, by the way, not the only approach that uh, takes the perspective that you have multiple layers of product owners. I think even Scrum at scale has product owners at each level of the fractal rather than one product owner. Large scale Scrum and Nexus take the other perspective um, that if you have one product, you have one product owner. Uh, which um, makes a lot of sense as well, because you do want the product owner to be the entrepreneur behind the product to really be empowered to look at this product as a business and make the right choices about it. Um, that creates the challenges of how do you actually keep up with all of the needs of your teams. The professional Scrum and large scale Scrum approach is to say you have great teams, you have awesome teams, they, they need to step up and take on a lot of the responsibilities of product ownership. Safe takes the approach that um, beyond that, in most organizations, we do need to carve out in each agile team somebody or for, or for each agile team, somebody that would actually take on these product ownership responsibilities and work closely with the team. Um, and to create this sort of product ownership, product management team that has the product 
manager who's more customer facing, strategic, marketing or business oriented, working together with product owners that are a bit more tactically oriented. Safe chose to call the art level product ownership role product management because that's a role that, you know, that, that's a name, that's a practice that's familiar to a lot of organizations, especially uh, product companies. Uh, so Safe chose to do something familiar. It actually helps because a lot of product managers out there feel more connected to, you know, this level of role, to being a product manager. Mm -hmm. They kind of shy away from the product owner perspective of working very closely with the team. So this is an area of safe where <clears throat> I think a lot of people and myself included would kind of provide some criticism, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a contentious spot. And yep. what we see in a lot of organizations when we install professional scrum, right? When we do the trainings and we work with these companies, they have this structure in place already. They have product managers and then they have business analysts who are writing the user stories. And, and then we have this proxy product ownership issue and it's something that we try to eliminate very quickly. Uh, there's mm -hmm. delays in decision making. There's lack of true ownership. We have business analysts who have been reduced to um, product backlog item kind of managers or um, story writers or um, and then having to get permission on the the actual product direction from multiple people. And it leads to delays. It leads to issues. And so this is something com I would say that is antithetical to professional scrum. We are trying to, to smash this down into a fully empowered one, you know, one person who can make a decision. And it looks like Safe has blown this out or actually has just accepted what we would consider in the professional scrum world to be an anti-pattern, has fully embraced it. And not only that, has given a, a position for each one. Is that reasonable so far or have I, have I strayed a little bit? No, it's very reasonable to say. And the, it is one of the areas where, to be honest, I struggle as, you know, both a safe guy, safe fellow, and a professional scrum trainer. I, I see exactly uh, what you're talking about. And, you know, I try to create real product ownership in organizations and that product owner proxy business analyst, just being called a product owner is definitely a problem that I see. I guess my view on it, and you might argue that that's Yuval's view on it and a lot of the... Most of the other safe practitioners out there maybe, you know, don't subscribe to it. That's a different conversation. My take on it is safe takes the evolutionary approach here. We might, I mean, there's the risk of just calling, you know, putting lipstick on a pig, you know, calling people a different name and just, you know, moving on. There is also the opportunity to actually use this opportunity to make sure that we are creating healthier product ownership at the team level while acknowledging that that maybe it's going to be too hard for the organization that is trying to do this to really settle for one product owner Agile product manager that's working directly with 100, 150 people. That, that's basically the, the reality. I, th I think what we need to acknowledge is that in the real world, the desire to have one product owner is noble. And it's a good direction to, to push towards. Um, the risk of just saying, you know, product owners at the team level, just identify somebody, put the hat on somebody. You know, it's risky. We need, I hope all safe practitioners understand where we want to go with this and try to push the team level product owner farther and closer to, you know, having a real product that they own and to take at least part of the product or at least when they work on features within 
the product that they really take ownership for it rather than become order takers, story writers, all of the you know misunderstood product ownership stances that we we talk about in the professional scrum product owner world. So there's a, a lot of directions we could go here. So when you when you bury a person in a team and place so much management over them, how do they ever elevate out of that team story writer role? Like, what does that look like in safe? Because we've had this, we've had the evolutionary comment come up a few times in the Scrum Master discussion, now in the product owner discussion. What are the mechanisms that are, are pushing this product owner up and if this product owner starts moving up towards that product manager level discussion and, and decision making, well, what is that product manager doing? And and does that leave a, a void at the team? Like, what is that progression, I, I, to use your terms in the real world, actually look like? Or does this person stay buried at that team level and there really isn't a progression? I take issue with uh, classifying this as burying that person under layers of management. Um, well, when you take the product owner and I, and I don't, I mean, I'll, I'll, we can use language that's less, I mean, no, I, it's I not wanna... the language that I take issue with. It's the, but I'm looking at the, the picture that I'm looking at the picture and that product owner is squarely buried into that team area. And you have a product manager who's sitting over them at that more program level. So what I heard I mean, you, you say couldn't... was that, that product okay, owner is trying to elevate and make more of a product manager type decision, but how do they bridge that gap? And if they do it, then what is that product manager doing? I guess that's that that might be a better way for yeah. me to, to frame that. Yeah. So, so the lines are not black and white here. Okay. And it's not a management. The product manager sits on top of the product owner situation. It's focus areas. It's a lot of collaboration over a lot of the elements here. It's involvement of product owners when we make prioritization decisions at the um, at the edge of release train level, at the what safe calls the the program backlog or the art backlog. It's it's a team, right? It's a collaboration of a team that has the product management on the team, product product owners on the team, and they work together. To identify, you know, product vision, where to, you know, pro product priorities. Um, there are different focus areas for the different people on that team, but it is a team that collaborates rather than a very square, limited box in which the the product owner um, is jailed or buried. Uh, that's where that's how Safe talks about it. That's how it should be. I, you know, there are organizations which, you know have product owners at the team level that, you know, don't consider themselves entrepreneurs, experimenters, influencers, um, customer representatives. When you have these people, they turn very quickly into what they know how to do, which is to take orders, manage people, um, you know, scribe. But that shouldn't and, and be And that's surprising. a shame, right? But no. it shouldn't be surprising, right? Structurally, we've put a product manager over this person, right? So structurally, we're saying we have this person who's looking at the bigger picture. And that, that's where I get hung up. And I'm not... That's definitely a risk. Yeah, okay. it's definitely a risk in this structure. I, I would acknowledge that. It takes a very right. servant leadership type of product management, very enlightened product management with the right sort of coaching to make sure that it's not... Uh, you know, I make the big picture decisions and you just go build stories, but more of a collaboration. So when a product owner, a product manager, an, an art um, leader, when all of these people disagree about the def mm. about the direction of the product, who mm. wins? Because, I mean, ultimately, let's say so right now they're all they're all deadlocked. How do we get past that? So you mentioned another role here. You mentioned an earlier as well, the release train engineer, the art leader. These people aren't a function in making product decisions. I mean, they have a okay. voice. They, you know, they're a stakeholder for product decisions, but it's like the scrum master and the product owner. The RT is actually the chief scrum master for the edge of release train. They have no product uh, accountability. So let's bring them out of the picture. Uh, eventually, 
It's the product manager that makes a decision when it's a decision that's at the edge of release train level. If it's a decision that is within the scope of a a feature that an agile team is, is working on, the product owner is empowered to make decisions around what should be the scope within that feature or not. Now, there could be a situation where there's a contention around should the feature look like this? Should the feature look like that? Do we want to spend three sprints on this uh, feature or one sprint on this feature? And the product manager will be involved in that. Same like in Scrum, even when we say there's one product owner for the product, there's somebody else that probably has an opinion about that product that might be able to overrule that product owner, unless the product owner is the real CEO in that organization. It's going to be unhealthy if they do that all the time. Same like in safe, it's going to be unhealthy if they do that all the time. But there is that situation. Well, and and so that's that's a point I have to concede, right? So having a fully empowered product owner that owns the budget, the strategy, the tactics, and everything else about a product is very difficult to achieve in a professional scrum setting, right? So, th- I mean, that is, um, that that is, I think, going to, but that's going to manifest here as well. I'd imagine even yep. your product managers have, I, I'm really looking at product manager on this chart as being the true product owner and the product owner in a mm-hmm. safe setting yes. is a business analyst. And that's... Uh, I mean, yes to the first part of your sentence. That's how I look at it as well. I'd rather see the product owner at the team level as a studying product owner, um, you know, an up and coming product owner. uh, Yeah, we call those business analysts. (laughs) No, I I mean. But I mean, on the professional scrum side. You see where I'm I'm going, right? I, I, I get it. No, I, I, it's like that junior product product manager, but not from like a a year or skill. It's just that that starting point towards. I get it. Uh, we we have the same. We have a similar conundrum on the product on the professional scrum side. A lot of product owners come from the business analyst, um, product management type of of realm, and they have a lot of uh, look, a lot of learning to do. Scrum. I mean, we every every. Adoption, whether it's Scrum, you're adopting Scrum, you're adopting Safe. There's skills and growth and and learning to do. But yeah, we have a very similar. Well, where who should be the product owner and where does that come from and what skills do they need to have and how does that all fit and so yeah, it, it's yeah. it's another one and of those where. A... Good. I, I think business analysis and product management provide two very different sets of challenges for coming into the product owner role. Um, The main risk with business business analysts is that they're so used to just consider what the customers say as requirements. They're used to be order takers. They struggle to say no, to think strategically about what should be in the future or what should be in the product. That's their real challenge, you know, their common challenge that we need to work with. I find it's still an issue, but less of an issue with product management. Um, Product managers that come into the agile product owner role needs need to understand agility, empiricism, taking on the experimenter, um, you know, stance, um, which is relevant for business analysts as well. Um, But I find it's different conversations with these two audiences. Um, And I would say in broad strokes, it's a bigger challenge um, when business analysts needs to step up into the or transition into a product owner role. This is why, by the way, I I really see it as a very different thing. The product owner at the agile team level in SAFE is not a business analyst or should not be just a business analyst. I mean, a business analyst could be a great person 
to go into that not... role, assuming that they learn new right. stances and they start to behave differently. But it's also not a product manager. Right. So, the, I mean, the, the no, distinction it's not here a product is manager at so that level. I, I think what this and, and again, I, my cynical brain immediately just goes to, well, they, they took a, and by they, I mean, all the, the safe, the safe people. Right. So they is just this safe, you know, this general generic. Uh, I'm casting a wide net here, but they take they took a look at a typical modern organization and they said, well, we don't they don't ever do real product owners anyways. And so let's put this layering in because at least we'll have a person at the team level who can write the stories. We'll have a person looking at value at a higher level, probably some kind of director or VP level that's actually empowered to spend money. We're not going to fight the organization and make them change. We're going to put this in. And then hopefully at some point we can teach or train them to progress past this, this model. Right. So that's where, where yeah, I'm that, at. That's safe. That... Yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's even in the name. Safe is safer to start with. It's more evolutionary from a change management perspective with a huge risk that you'll yeah. misunderstand. And well, with stay the risk that, that with lipstick you... on a pig. Right. And, and so once you've spent the money and the consultants leave and we have this in, it's like, well, we've installed safe. And so my the question I always have with, with this picture in particular and the product owner role uh, in safe is especially, what is the trigger or what is the, cause you need some kind of forcing function. You need some kind of incentive. Uh, for a product owner to progress, for, a, for, for an organization to basically say, we're going to end up with a fully empowered person who can make decisions. So what does that look like in a, in a safe environment? Does that question make sense, Yuval? Because I would imagine most like inertia sets in once the installation is done and most organizations do not move past the install. That would be so my let assumption. Me, let me mirror the question back to you. So what... Sure. In professional scrum is driving product owners to really be empowered because we, you know, most organizations that install scrum don't have an empowered product owner either. Is well, it that but, they, you know, go to advanced product ownership, you know, training? Is it that some but we explicitly scrum coaches state, come in? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get it. I, yeah, th this is a big anti-pattern in, in our world too. Right. So this is, this is, we, I mean, we, we have to teach against it. It's, it's so we acknowledge it, but we also explicitly state this is what the product owner should be. And we, and we, like, there's no, well, we get where you're at and we're going to install this as the base pattern and then hope you move. It is in professional scrum. This is the bar for the product owner and we've got to get here. I don't see that in the safe setup. There's I, not what enough I, what I, of it in the safe setup. Yeah. I mean, well, what I, I do that. with organizations that I work with is I use well, professional scrum to get them there. I okay. teach, you know, product owners in safe. I teach them the advanced, you know, uh, scrum product ownership, the professional scrum product ownership, advanced class. I talk about the stances. We identify which of <clears> these <throat> misunderstood stances do we see ourselves in, which, which of the oh. ones, the preferred stances do we struggle with the most in our context both looking in the mirror both what's the setup does the setup allow us uh to be yeah. there so that's the conversations that that i have well, i would I, I've, love I've for been, Go ahead. I, i've been in your i've been in your class i i think you do a great job by by kind of merging this the the two worlds right the only reason i understand the differences is because you're you're very clear about them so no i i don't this isn't a gotcha it's not this is a this is one of those areas where it's like, oh, I wish they would fix this. But I also think that this, in my opinion, I don't want to speak for you, my opinion, kind of this misread of product management slash product ownership in general could be a contributor to why the larger tech companies like Google, like Microsoft, like Amazon, like Netflix, this disconnect could actually be one of the reasons why they would not look at safe as a viable option. Maybe because I think maybe. they have broken some product owner, product management stuff here. Um, let me provide, I mean, maybe let me provide a different perspective on this. So sure. I've worked with mo most of my clients over the years don't have business analysts. 
because they're right. product companies. Product companies rarely have that that role, right? Uh, at least you know the companies that I've worked with. But many of them actually have a pattern that is similar to this one. So I've worked with a fintech company in Israel some years ago. Uh, before we even implemented Safe, there was the product manager, more like a strategic product manager, who paired up with a technical product manager. That was the term that they used, and it's a common term in the uh, product management world. I think pragmatic marketing might even be teaching it. I'm not sure, but that's a common practice that kind of that is kind of similar to what we're seeing here. So that sure. technical product manager, you know, was mapped to product owner when that organization uh, eventually uh, started, you know, to use, uh, started to use safe. And it, it worked nicely for them uh, with the same, you know, considerably okay, um, with the same risks that we talked about. I guess another pattern, another way that I try to get out of this situation or, or help out within this structure is to look at the bigger product that, you know, you need an age of release train for, that you need 100, 150 people for, and descale it. And, and I think that's what the big tech companies are very good at because their architecture, their their product, they, they know how to break things into smaller products. And once you can break an agile release train, a product into a smaller set of products, you can actually see the product owner that's working with one or two agile teams as a real product owner for that sub product. So that's a design pattern for an agile release train that I like more than you know, one monolithic product with product owners just taking features from the same backlog. If we're able architecturally, both from a product architecture and a technical architecture, carve these things out, it helps. I can tell you about, a, you know, I'm, I'm working now with a pharma company that's, you know, looking at uh, implementing SAFE and our conversations around how do we structure the organization there that's dealing with enterprise applications in agile teams that are empowered product teams. We even, you know, uh, use the language of uh, empowered product teams. How do we create that? What are the relationships that we need to have between these smaller product teams into larger products? Do okay, let's handle that those relationships when they're there via an agile release train and have product management at that level. But because we created very empowered agile teams with their own products, product management is really, you know, providing coherence, cohesive strategy alignment, but it's a lighter weight role compared to the, the product ownership role that, um, that exists at each team levels. And, and it's a, Achieving that healthy balance is uh, where I think the, the solution is for, um, for this topic from a topology perspective. Yeah, I, I think that's just pragmatic, right? So I think that's, I, if, it, if it were me working on a, a safe implementation like this, I would drop professional scrum on top of this product owner area and, and try to, to balance that out like you're saying. And I think that's actually what you do. Um, yeah. And I think that's smart. This is a section that just needs, this is why I, you know, some, some people would say, well, I'll never work in a safe shop or I'll never go. I, I love going in and teaching professional scrum to a company that's installed safe, especially professional scrum product ownership. Right. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, it's a good space for that. And I think you've taken a pretty pragmatic approach to it. Um, this idea I of, can... go ahead. Good. I was just going to say the idea of descaling, I think, is so critical. And it's probably why the major tech players aren't using a framework like this. Um, but they, all, they, they have a few factors that most modern organizations have not invested in. They have technical excellence. They have amazing architectures, right? So it doesn't matter which framework you lay into one of these companies. They're going to be able to move quickly because their architecture is built for rapid development. They also mm -hmm. ruthlessly organize around product delivery. 
Like if you're Netflix, you have to ship. You don't have, um, you have to be on 24 seven. You have to ship and you have to be focused around the, the delivery platform. And not every organization takes that stance, right? Yeah. A lot of organizations are, are organized around an org chart that this, this, you know, seven, eight layer topology of, of managing people. These modern organizations are not that way. So they have tech ex excellence. Um, they have the architectures in place to actually support agility. Uh, they have the, the team structures that actually support dev development and delivery. And then you can take these structures like safe or less or dad or Nexus, and they work beautifully. Um, I would say the one thing about safe that I would, I mean, there's many things that you can say nice about it. It does pretty much put some, some guides and guards and principles on top of a typical company. And then basically says, all right, we're going to start doing some, some iterative planning. We're going to start looking at value. We're going to, I do think it does start the discussion. Um, I will always come back to the idea of what sparks the evolution towards a professional scrum outlook. What sparks, what sparks us to, to move past this. And uh, that's where I think I'm always going to have that hang up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Um, Safe talks about accelerate. I mean, in the implementation roadmap, there is this, you know, as you're saying, we, we get going, we start, we, you know, from crawl, we stand, we start to walk. Eventually, we want to aim higher and higher. There's, you know, uh, competencies that talk about, you know, measuring and growing our maturity, looking at our flow metrics. I know you love flow metrics. Um, looking at are we achieving useful outcomes for our business you know yep. um, you could use ebm uh with safe to drive it forward you could use a lot of elements to drive it forward and a lot of them are in there in safe uh, the most important thing in all of that is what you see at the bottom of you know this big picture on the on the right here which is the lean agile leadership competency i mean if your leadership wants to you know just install a framework and say that they've installed the framework and and move on nothing's gonna help but if they're passionate about continuous improvement if they really understand you know the lineage principles of you know things are complex we need to continue to try and find what's working we need to base decisions on empiricism. We need to think economically. We need to look end-to-end -end and improve the value stream. We constantly want to organize around value. All of these things are things that, you know, I doubt any professional scrum practitioner or that professional scrum practitioners would take issue with. Safe drives towards these directions. It has the right principles like many other frameworks and areas there's the risk that people would just not pay attention once they once they start once they think they reach the you know the high ground you yeah i mean I, spcs like you know professional scrum masters are there to help drive the the organization forward um but you need to have the right people to do that. <laughs> we have a struggle with that in the professional scrum world as well. Uh, I, I, I agree. It is often difficult to um, achieve the organizational changes necessary to keep moving forward, right? That inertia does definitely set in. Well, you've all, I think we've talked about the product owner role, how um, it's been broken apart. Some would argue that they broke it. Um, I would say an injection of professional scrum would be beneficial here. I think you can just quiet nod if you like, or <laughs> I think we're both on the yes. same page here. And I like the way that yeah. you, 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 you talked about finding that sweet spot and, and mixing in those pr from a principal perspective, there's definitely some alignment here, but they, it definitely does break out that role. And I, I appreciate you talking through that and walking through it. Um, Love to know what everyone else thinks about this. What are your questions about the product owner role in SAFE? Um, what do you think about this discussion that we put together here? Uh, leave your questions below. Your questions turn into 
uh, into question or your questions, ugh, your questions turn into videos, right? So you've all and I are going to keep this series going for as long as it's interesting to all of you. So let us know what your big questions are about safe, about professional scrum, where they intersect, where they come apart. And uh, we will definitely take care of those in the future. Be sure to check out some other videos here. We got our scrum framework and our EBM course. They're free. Check them out. Buy a new hoodie or sweatshirt. We just released the story points are trash t-shirt. Go ahead and check that out in the merch store as well. For Yuval and Ryan, go forward and uh, yeah, dig into this product owner idea, especially if you're a safe shop. Look at how it's working. Look at some improvements. See if there's ways to advance the practice. Let us know your questions, concerns, and thoughts, and we'll see you next time.